My wife Jody decided that spending the night with another man would be fun. She also thought I wouldn't mind. She may have been right that the night would be fun, but she sure screwed up thinking I wouldn't mind. I sat at my desk, sipped my coffee, and smiled. I thought back to the morning with my wife Jody. Her name is Jodel, but everyone calls her Jody. She was great. We met in high school and, for the most part, only dated each other. I say mostly because the few times we had what we called disagreements, we both dated other people, but always came back to each other. We gave each other our virginity a month before prom and two weeks after my 18th birthday. Her 18th birthday was exactly one month before mine, and we were married nine months after graduation. She was my only sexual partner, and as far as I knew, I was her only one. My cell phone rang. I looked to see if I knew who was calling. I give my business card and get calls from numbers I don't know, so I can't answer them selectively. I hate scam calls and have gotten calls more than once offering to fix my computer, improve my credit, or get better health care. But I especially hate it when the caller says he or she is calling from the IRS and that I have a problem with my tax return, and if I don't call them immediately, they will send the cops after me. I can tolerate legitimate calls when honest people are trying to make a living, but I hate con artists and thieves, and as soon as I recognize them, I start describing to them what I'm going to do after I shove a broom up their ass. After that, they usually hang up quickly. Anyway, my cell phone rang. Jody's office number popped up on the screen. My first thought was, why is she calling from her office phone and not her cell phone? So I answered, Hi, honey. This isn't your wife, Mr. Taylor. That's my name. Taylor. John Richard Taylor III. And as is customary in some parts of the country, being third in line with the same name, I was called Trey. Jody works for an insurance company. I sell RVs and concentrate on high-end carriages. Neither Jody nor I graduated from college, but we think we're doing okay. We live in a house owned by my mother and stepfather and pay no rent while we save money to buy our own place. We like the house and the neighborhood, and to be honest, we're in no hurry to move. My name is Michael Hamilton. I work with your wife. What can I do for you, Mr. Hamilton? Hopefully it's more of what I can do for you. I have information about your wife that I think you should know. Can you meet with me this afternoon around noon? What kind of information? Is she all right? She was fine the last time I saw her, and as for the information I have, I prefer to discuss it in person. Look, Mr. Hamilton, I don't know what kind of joke you're trying to pull on my wife, but I don't have time for this. Just tell her I didn't fall for it and I'll see her home. Wait a minute, Mr. Taylor. This isn't a joke and she doesn't know I'm calling. Meet me and maybe you can stop her from having an affair. I'll be at Spike's restaurant at noon. It's on the corner of Ryan and Alamo. I'll be wearing a gray suit with a blue tie. He hung up the phone. What the hell had just happened? A complete stranger had just told me I could stop my wife from having an affair if I met him. If that was her joke, I was not in the mood for jokes. So now I'm in a quandary. Do I meet him and fall for the joke? What if it wasn't a joke? Shit. At noon, I was standing outside Spikes. A man approached me and asked if I was John Taylor. I assured him I was and told him we should go inside. He suggested we walk around a bit so no one would overhear us. So we set off in the direction of Central Park. We had just started walking and I asked what was the matter. I started working with your wife two months ago. We work in the same section. Almost immediately, I started hearing about her and the man in our section. It took another week or so before I began to see for myself. His name is Stan Morrison, and they go to lunch together almost every day. They make no secret of their friendship and talk openly. Today, almost the entire office overheard them talking about where they would go tomorrow night. They decided to go to the Hilton because it has a nice restaurant and there is live music tomorrow night. They plan to have dinner and then dance to the live music, then go up to their room and spend the night. He's even called to make reservations. Even as we speak, your wife is shopping for clothes for their date. Tomorrow night? And spend the night together? And how are they going to accomplish that? She's going to tell you the truth. She's convinced that you love her enough to let her experience another man since you're the only one she's ever had. I overheard this information last week. She genuinely believes that this will not affect your marriage in any way. I think that's why they feel safe talking openly. She doesn't think you'll have a problem with it. Why are you telling me this? I was married for nine years and my wife had an affair. 
the legal system screwed me more than her lover ever screwed her. Now she and her boyfriend live in a house that I pay for, and my kids call him daddy. I, on the other hand, live in a dumpy apartment and eat beans and rice five times a week. I see this as a chance to help someone else escape my situation. We talked some more and he left to go back to work. I was left to ponder my marriage and future. I came to the conclusion that if he was telling the truth, my marriage was over. It scared me that I could so easily think about the possible destruction of my marriage based only on a relatively short conversation with a complete stranger. But I thought back to my youth and remembered the pain my mother went through. My father was an alcoholic and a womanizer. He had several affairs and talked openly about them. He even teased my mother about it. I asked her why she put up with it. I love him, she replied. One day when I was about 11 years old, he took me to his current girlfriend's house with him. The two of them were somewhere in the house and I was in the living room with her dog. I got tired of sitting there and petting the dog, so I left and walked about a mile home. When I got home, I told my mother where I had been. We only had one car, so she and I walked to where the car was parked. She made no effort to confront them, and I don't know if he realized I was gone. We took the car and drove home. I didn't see him for about a week and my mother wouldn't let him in the house. Two days after she finally allowed him back, he spanked me with a belt for dropping a kitchen plate and breaking it. But upon reflection, I decided that the real reason was because I had snitched on him. Given my childhood experiences and the way my mother had suffered, I didn't see any circumstances in which I would or could condone Jody having an affair. Even thinking about her having an affair was too much for me. Call me a jerk, insensitive, insolent, brash, arrogant, patronizing, or whatever else you want to call me but I wasn't going to go through what my mother had to go through. Eventually, she found the strength to leave my father, and we were much better off. That was many years ago. He still lives in town, but we rarely see each other, and that's fine with me. She remarried and is very happy. As I mentioned before, Jody and I live in the house she and my stepfather own. What am I supposed to do now? Confront Jody or ignore the information I just received? Wait and see what happens. As a salesperson, you can't keep waiting for someone to walk through the door ready to buy. You have to be proactive. Hand out your business card. Make phone calls. Talk to people. Anticipate, be persistent and persistent, and know your product. Well, in this case, knowing your product can be a problem. If what Michael Hamilton told me is true, I don't know Jody at all. And she apparently doesn't know me. I had made no secret of my feelings about the adultery, and she was well aware of my marital history. So I decided to take the initiative. But how exactly do you begin to take action in a situation that may not even exist? Start by envisioning every possible scenario. Anticipate the worst case scenario. Then choose a course of action and determine what your decision might result in the best case scenario and what might result in the worst case scenario. If you are not ready to accept the worst possible outcome, choose another course of action and keep choosing until you determine what you can accept. I made a decision and decided that my first task was to find a private investigator. There were several in the phone book. I picked one at random, called, and was instructed to come right away. Thirty minutes later, I was in his office. Two hours later, he had a lot of my dollars and we had worked out a plan. Now it was time to drive home. I had no idea how I was going to act with her tonight. When I arrived, she was home. When I walked in, she came up to me to kiss and hug me like she usually did. I thought for a long time about how I should act. I could either act normal, in which case she would assume that everything was fine and her plans could go on, unless of course she actually had any plans. Or I could have somehow hinted to her about what I had heard. If I did, she could deny everything and put it off until things settled down. If she molded over now, what was to stop her from changing her mind or even doing it sometime in the future? I wasn't going to live with that possibility. The other side of the coin was that if she found out that I suspected her, it might cause her to abandon her plan. I decided to act normal. Dinner was almost ready. She was waiting for me to fry the pork chops. I did so and we ate. Acting normal turned out to be harder than I thought it would be. For me. However, she was either a very good actress or, as Michael Hamilton said, she was so confident that she was completely unperturbed and natural. Around 11 o'clock, I went upstairs to get ready for bed. Jody was already asleep. I showered and went to bed, but sleep didn't come. At six in the morning, she got up, got dressed, and went downstairs. A few minutes later, I got up, got dressed, and went downstairs. She was gone. 
I can count on the fingers of one hand the number of times either of us left the house without kissing her goodbye. This was one of them. It was Friday, usually a good day for RV sales, but I called my boss and told him I'd take the day off. I called the attorney the dealership used and asked if he knew a good divorce attorney. He referred me to his wife. But let me warn you. She can't stand husbands who screw around with their wives, so if you did that, she probably won't take your case. He called her and immediately sent me to her. I told her about my conversation with Michael Hamilton. Her first question was, why did I see fit to contact a lawyer and hire an investigator based only on an unsubstantiated story from a complete stranger? I then told her about my parents and my personal intolerance for adultery or anything approaching it. She recommended that I wait and confirm his story. She also remarked that if Jody was as confident as Hamilton said that our marriage would not suffer, then she really had nothing to lose by having a little affair. I informed her that I would never tolerate an affair, small or otherwise, and if Jody carries out her plans for tonight, I want her delivered to us no later than Monday. If Hamilton is lying or wrong, I'll have to be prepared to eat a lot of crow, but if he's telling the truth, I'll be ready. Though doubtful, she assured me that the paperwork would be ready and all it would take was to point out a place where she would be served if it came to that. By 1 p.m., I was back at my desk trying to sell the van to retired people who had been married for almost 50 years. At first, I was hesitant to sell a 45-foot motorhome to such an elderly couple, but after talking to them and watching the way they interacted, my doubts disappeared. He acted younger than I did and moved with more agility. In fact, I envied both his apparent youth and vigor and their relationship. I had been working with them for several weeks, and they now seemed to be ready to buy. They picked out the car they wanted, and we drove it down the highway. Their last name was Jacobson, and Mr. Jacobson, who was driving the car, looked comfortable and confident behind the wheel. I had a hard time concentrating on what I was doing, but I enjoyed their chatter as they discussed the pros and cons of owning a motorhome. They were exactly how I wanted Jody and I to be after a long and happy marriage. Finally, I decided to give them a new added incentive. I decided to call it the tray discount. I had never done this before, but I really liked them and added some of my commission as an additional discount. They bought the van and left with smiles on their faces. It was time to go home. I contacted my investigator and was assured everything was ready. At half past five, I pulled into the garage. Jody's car was parked in its usual spot. I walked inside and smelled no odor indicating that dinner was being prepared. I was as calm, cool, and collected as I could possibly be. I placed the package the investigator had given me on the mantelpiece and, resisting the urge to find her, sat in the chair and waited to see what would happen. The wait was not long. At quarter to six, she came downstairs, dressed to kill, and apparently in the clothes that Michael Hamilton had told me she had bought the day before. She was gorgeous, and she had her overnight bag with her. Wow, you look gorgeous. What's the occasion? One of the guys at work has been pushing for me to go out with him, and I thought it would be fun. What do you mean go out with him? Like on a date? Yes. What kind of date? Well, we thought that since you're the only man I've ever been with, I'd be interested in having sex with someone else, so we'd have dinner, go dancing, and then spend the night at a hotel. I couldn't believe how calm she was, and how much my sense of calm, cool and collected had been replaced by a huge cold knot where my stomach should be. You can't be serious. You're spending the night with another man? There's no way in hell I'm agreeing to that. And who the hell is this we you're talking about? I wasn't asked that. It's no big deal. Just one night of play. I'll come home tomorrow and it'll be like nothing ever happened. Besides, I can learn a couple tricks you might like. There's no way you're going out tonight and having fun with someone else. Don't be silly. Of course I will. Jody, if you do, our marriage is over. At that moment, we heard a car horn honk. That's him, she said, heading for the front door. I beat her to it. Please don't do this, I said, blocking her path. I have to go. She stepped around me and tried to kiss me. I'll be home tomorrow around noon and you'll see that nothing has changed. If you get in the car, you'll have nowhere to go back to. Now you're really stupid. Have a nice evening thinking about how much fun I'm having. Tomorrow when I get home, we can get into it. Good night. She kissed me on her way out the door. I didn't watch her get into the car.
I walked over to the fireplace and turned off the recorder I had placed there. I carried the box of trash bags upstairs. It took me almost two hours to remove all evidence that she had ever lived here. I emptied her closet and her part of the bathroom vanity. I even took the few pieces of jewelry she had, her birth certificate, high school diploma, and social security card out of the safe. I carried it all downstairs and set it by the garage door. Then I went through the stairs, gathering her things. Family photo albums, school awards, and the bronze statue of Remington's work that she had gotten from her grandfather. I even took down all the little magnets she'd hung on the refrigerator. I stuffed everything in her car. Then I rolled it out of the garage and parked it on the street. I put the keys in the driver's seat. I got into bed and tried to sleep. I couldn't. I just tossed and turned. Finally, I got up and made some coffee. Turned on the TV and tried to watch a nightly Hogan's Heroes marathon and drink my coffee. For two nights in a row now, I couldn't sleep. I felt like a zombie. I was at the car dealership early. By 11 o'clock, I had completed the deal with the Jacobsons from the day before, and they were driving off the lot in their heavily discounted carriage. I also completed all the financial transactions that I felt were necessary. At quarter to 12, I was home and received a new set of house keys from the locksmith. My investigator was also there with copies of the video recordings he had made over the last 18 hours. At half past 12 p.m., I was watching the videotape I received from the investigator when I heard the front doorbell ring. I walked to the door and opened it. Hey, sweetie. My key doesn't work, and why is my car parked outside? I stood in the doorway, preventing her from coming in. Your key doesn't work because you don't live here anymore. And your car is parked outside because since you don't live here anymore, I don't want it parked in my garage. What are you talking about? This is my house. Now let me in, she said, trying to get around me. I told you last night that if you get in that man's car, you have nowhere to go back to. All your stuff is in your car. You can't be serious, it was just... I didn't hear what she said because I slammed the door in her face. She pounded on the door for a few minutes before I opened it. If you don't stop banging on my door, I'm going to call the police and have you arrested. I probably couldn't do that, but I had nothing to lose. You can't do that. This is my house. This house belongs to my mother and stepfather, and they determine who lives here, and they have determined that you no longer live here. Now leave. Again, legally, I probably couldn't do that, but I did anyway. I slammed the door in her face a second time and continued watching the tape. After a while, I looked out the window and she was already sitting in her car. I went to the kitchen to get a drink of water but changed my mind and had a gin and tonic. I watched another tape. As the day went on, I got angrier and angrier. I heard the doorbell ring. Well, not exactly ringing, it was constant and continuous. If it was Jody again, and in the mood she was in, I'd probably rip her cunt open and feed it to the neighborhood dogs. I ran to the door and jerked it open to see her sister Judy standing there leaning on the doorbell. Jodell and Judy. Their parents had little imagination. Their brother's name was Jacob. I just looked at her. You're an asshole. My sister is sitting in my house crying and I want to know why. Screw those sisters, I thought, slamming the door in her face. Slamming doors was starting to take on a therapeutic effect. I turned to go back to my room and the bell rang again. I jerked the door open and, before she could stop ringing, slammed her hand so hard on the bell that she lost her balance and almost fell. If you ring that bell one more time, I'll break your damn fingers one at a time. I started slamming the door again. She pressed herself against it with her whole body and held it open. Talk to me. Please. After standing there for a few seconds, I slowly opened the door and indicated that she could come in. She stepped into the room and stopped, then looked up at me. I thought you loved Jody. I can't believe you kicked her out over such a stupid disagreement. Stupid disagreement? She told me that you disagreed with her about the walk last night and kicked her out because of it. Oh, God. She's right about the disagreement. She wanted to go out and I didn't want to. Did she tell you that the person she wanted to go out with wasn't me? That it was a guy she worked with? You've got to be kidding me. Did she tell you that their plan was to have dinner, then go dancing, and then spend the night in a hotel room? You can't be serious. You're making it up, she sat up. And she told you she was going to come home tonight and show me what she learned. Listen, 
I played her the audio tape I'd made the night before. I had no idea. Yeah, neither did I. So what are you going to do? Divorce her. Oh, no. Any chance of getting over it? I shook my head. She tried to say something else, but I stopped her. Look, Judy, I have no intention of forgiving or forgetting what she did. This marriage is over. Period. She nodded, thought for a couple minutes, then shrugged and stood up. I walked her to the door. She stood there looking at me. I opened the door and escorted her out. All evening and all day Sunday, I did nothing. I ate two grilled cheese sandwiches and drank a couple more glasses of gin and tonic. Self-pity was quickly taking over my spirit. There was a knock at the door. It was Judy. You said if I rang the bell one more time, you'd break my fingers. So I knocked. It didn't take long. I've been talking to Jody all day. What you told me is true. It wasn't easy for her to tell me about her date, but she finally came clean. What you don't know is that nothing happened. I indicated for her to come through and sit down. I sat down across from her. What do you mean nothing happened? She told me that after he picked her up here, they went to the hotel. They ordered a bottle of champagne before ordering dinner and had time to drink half of it when the waiter took their dinner order. By the time dinner arrived, they were already working on the second bottle of champagne. Halfway through dinner, it was empty. After drinking all the champagne, they decided they were too drunk to dance and headed upstairs to their room. They had intended to have fun, but were too drunk to accomplish what they had planned. They both passed out. She woke up first and realized what she had done. She woke him up and insisted he take her home. Well, that's quite a story. You believe her, don't you? I believe that she and some man spent several days, maybe weeks or months, planning a date. During the planning process, they spent time together at lunch and at work, maybe even after work. They talked and made plans. Over the time they spent together, they grew close. They laughed together. They took walks together. They exchanged secrets. He probably knows more about my marriage than I do. Hell, I know he knows. He knew my wife was planning to cheat on me. Maybe they held hands. They may have kissed or even fondled each other. They planned to spend the evening and night together to do it. That sounds like the ultimate in disrespect and betrayal, not love. She just looked at me. You don't believe her, do you? No, I don't. And you're not going to forgive her, even if nothing happened. Not in this life. We reached the door and she opened it. She paused. When this is over, can we still be friends? Jody and I are going through a divorce. If she goes to any lengths to prevent it, it's going to be very complicated. By the time it's over, you probably won't like me, so any friendship we have will probably come to naught. I see. Well, that could be nice. I think I'll miss you. With those words, she placed one hand on my left cheek and kissed my right cheek gently. Then she left, closing the door softly behind her. Since Saturday afternoon, my phone had been off more often than on. Jody had tried to talk to me too many times, but finally gave up. I managed to talk to her father. He tried to convince me that since nothing had happened between Jody and Stan, that meant that no big deal had happened and we should just suck it up and get over it. I explained it to him the same way I had explained it to Judy. When we finished talking, he realized that divorce was inevitable. He hung up the phone with a sigh. Monday came. The first thing I did was to call my attorney and tell her about the previous weekend. I also told her to serve Jody with a summons. She would either be at work or at her sister's house. I was assured that it would be served by the end of the day. It was a long day and I don't remember what I did. Shortly after four o'clock in the afternoon, my cell phone rang. I looked to see who was calling. It was Jody's office number. I took a chance and answered it. Trey Taylor. Good afternoon, Mr. Taylor. This is Michael Hamilton. I thought you might be interested to know that there was some excitement around here a while back. Really? Yes, sir. Your wife was served with a summons and after reading the papers, she fainted. An ambulance was called and she was taken to the hospital. As she fainted, she dropped the papers. After the paramedics left, Stan Morrison picked up the papers and looked them over. Then he almost fainted. If the situation had not been so serious, it might have seemed funny but I saw no humor in the destruction of yet another marriage and had no sympathy for either of them. 
I'll keep you posted on the events that take place here. You do that. My phone rang again. It was Judy. Hello? Jody's been taken to the hospital. So? Just thought you might want to know. No. I'm not the least bit interested in her or her health. Are you really that cold-hearted, Trey? All my cold hearts are directly related to your sister. I told you as early as yesterday that things were going to go south. This is only round one. The next few weeks went as well as could be expected. Jody tried to talk to me many times, but I was unwilling to listen to her. Both her father and mother tried to get me to talk to her. I refused them both. My mother spent a lot of time trying to make me feel better. I kept telling her there was nothing wrong with me, but she insisted there wasn't and tried even harder. Michael Hamilton called almost every day. He was fun to be around. He was the only one who knew what I knew about Morrison. Jody came to work but just sat in her seat, except when she was meeting with her lawyer. Jody and Morrison never spoke to each other. At least not in front of anyone else. Me? I was just stalling. Our lawyer set up a meeting. It was to be attended by two lawyers, Jody and me. It was the first time I'd seen her since I kicked her out. I couldn't help but notice that she had lost a little weight and looked a little haggard. I was surprised to see Judy there. Jody's lawyer asked if everything was okay. I looked at her. Are you sure you want to be here? I'm here for Jody. That's not what I asked for. No. But I need to be here. I told the lawyer I had no objection to her staying. Jody had already seated herself at the table, so everyone else sat down and her lawyer began. Mrs. Taylor categorically denies the alleged adultery and asks that the divorce petition be dismissed so that she and her husband can work to save the marriage. She agrees to counseling if that will help. My attorney and I looked at each other and smiled. My lawyer said, If there was no adultery, could Mrs. Taylor explain her actions that night? We all looked at her. I'd be happy to. I'll start by saying that a gentleman friend of mine came to pick me up. Does your friend have a name? My lawyer asked. Of course, but his name doesn't matter. Nothing terrible happened, so there's no reason to involve him in this case. I left the house and got into his car. We drove to the hotel. She went on to repeat almost word for word what Judy had told her, and of course what Judy had told me. Champagne, dinner, more champagne in the room and too drunk to have fun, that's my word, not hers. Both passed out, slept through the night, came home the next day, and her husband kicked her out. Oh, me. Poor misunderstanding me. I made a mistake. I love my husband and I want him to forgive me so we can have children and grow old together. I looked at Judy, who was scrutinizing every word and nodding in agreement. Okay, my lawyer said. Let's assume that everything you said is true and no sex took place. Was there any fondling or groping during the evening? Anything that wouldn't pass the husband test? Absolutely not, declared Jody with conviction. Judy nodded and smiled. My lawyer looked at me and I looked at her. A remote control lay in front of me. I picked it up and pressed play. A screen dropped down from the ceiling and it showed an image of Jody approaching Stan Morrison's car in our driveway. He got out of the car, walked over to her and opened her door. As she approached the car, they kissed. A long, heartfelt kiss. They got in the car and drove off. I pressed pause. Lie number one, said I to the room. Everyone was sitting a little more upright now. Jody was pale and Judy just sat there looking at her sister. On Thursday, when Michael Hamilton first called me and I talked to my investigator, we came up with a plan. Videotape Jody's every move on Friday night, starting with Stan Morrison's arrival at our house. From Hamilton's information, we knew where the date was to take place, and we knew they had already booked a room. We even knew the room number. But we didn't know if he could sneak into the room they had booked and videotape the whole thing. As it turned out, he could. You also said there was no inappropriate touching or caressing. Is that correct as well? Yes, a little hesitantly. I pressed play a second time. We watched as the happy couple followed the waiter to their table in the Hilton's dining room. Morrison's hand rested on Jody's ass. Lie number two. Jody looked around the room. Her lawyer was busily reading the divorce petition, and Judy suddenly found her fingernails delightful and scrutinized them intently. The video continued.
Jody and Morrison ordered a bottle of champagne. They had no sooner finished the first glass than they jumped up and headed for the elevator. It cost me $1,000 to get my investigator access to their suite before check-in, and four minutes after the couple entered, Jody was entertaining him. At that moment, Jody screamed and ran out of the room, followed by Judy. I pressed pause. It seems my client has not accurately recalled all the events of that evening. I'll talk to her and get back to you. Said her attorney, gathered up her papers, slipped them into a folder, and hurried after the two sisters. The lawyer and I chatted for a few minutes, and I headed back to the dealership. Shortly before closing time, Judy walked in and slowly approached my booth. I just sat there. She stood for a while before asking, May I sit down? Help yourself. Silence. You knew, didn't you? Knew what? When I came to your house that first Saturday, you already knew they were sleeping together. Yes. I watched the video before you came in. And I can promise you they weren't sleeping around that much. They were doing it, Judy. She's my wife and she let herself do it. Why didn't you tell me? I'm not sure. I guess I was hoping she'd admit it and agree to a divorce. If she had admitted it, I would have agreed to something other than adultery. Then you and your family wouldn't have to know what she did. I always liked your parents. Silence again. My cell phone rang. I answered it without hesitation. Trey Taylor? This is Michael Hamilton, Mr. Taylor. I was available yesterday, but I understand your wife called and quit. She didn't even come in to clear her desk. Thought you might like to know. Thanks. Let me know if you find out anything else. Judy started to speak, but was interrupted by the office loudspeaker. Trey, you have a call on line six. Trey, you have a call on line six. Trey Taylor. I picked up the phone and talked to the potential buyer for about 15 minutes. Judy sat there without moving. After I finished talking, Judy and I looked at each other. She's gone, Trey. What do you mean, gone? Dead? She loaded up the car and left. She probably just moved into her own place. I don't think so. She asked me to tell mom and dad that she's sorry she disappointed them. It wasn't just your parents she disappointed. Yeah, we know. Silence again. Look, Judy, I have to work, so if you don't... Oh, sure, yeah, sorry. She stood up. I'd better go. She stood and looked at me for a moment, then turned and walked away. That night, back at home, I picked up my copy of the videotape made by the investigator. My attorney still had the copy we had used earlier. I put it in the player and sat down. I only watched it in its entirety once. No romance. No love. He didn't care about her feelings or emotions. I sat there trying to control my emotions. Part of me wanted to scream in pain that my best friend and only love had betrayed me like this. The other part of me wanted to burn the bitch. My thoughts were like a bowl of spaghetti, all jumbled together with no order or direction. I fell asleep in my chair thinking about it. Ever since I'd first met Jody, whenever I thought about sex, her face came into my mind. Another two weeks went by. My lawyer tried several times to set up another meeting with Jody and her attorney, but failed. Jody couldn't be found. A month went by. Then another and another. There was still no word from her. During this time, I spoke to Judy and her parents several times. I asked if they had heard from her and always got a negative answer. I thought about calling an investigator to track her down, but my attorney talked me out of it. I canceled the credit cards and took half the money, but records show she hasn't touched anything of what's left. If she's gone for a few more months, we can sue on the grounds of desertion, but we'll see. The phone rang. Trey Taylor. Good morning, Mr. Taylor. This is Michael Hamilton, remember me? Of course I remember you. How are things going? Not bad. I thought I'd bring you up to speed. Remember I told you about my divorce? Of course I remember. As I recall, your ex was living in your house with her boyfriend. That's right. She was, he laughed. Lived there? Yes. I still live there now. With my kids. What happened? Apparently the guy's a thief. Somehow he managed to convince my ex that she should steal money from her company 
and now they're both in jail. I laughed. Good. Screw both of them. Are you still working at the same place? Yes. That's another reason I called. Since your wife left, the place has been pretty quiet, and Stan Morrison has kept mostly to himself. But in the last week or so, some of his phone calls have been quite interesting. Interesting how? Well, he was talking to your wife today. How do you know? I heard him say, I miss you too, Jody. Did you happen to overhear anything that might tell you where she is? I have a divorce petition for her to sign. I have the phone number she called from. Will that help? He laughed into the receiver. Where did you get that from? After Morrison finished talking to her, he went back to his desk, put the phone down, sat for a couple minutes, and went into his boss's office. I walked over, picked up his phone, looked at the last call, and wrote down the number. Simple and easy. Great job, Mr. Hamilton. Thank you. And if you hear anything else, keep me posted. You betcha. He then gave me a number, which I gave to my attorney. The area code was South Florida. I decided to make the call. Hello. Hi, Judy. This is Trey. What do you need, Trey? Do you or your family know anyone in Florida? Why? Because I think Jody is there. Why do you care where she is? Because I want a divorce, and to speed up the process, she has to get the papers and sign them. When are you going to ask? Ask what? Where in Florida does she live? I don't need to ask. My lawyer is working on finding her even as we speak. Maybe I can save him the trouble. She lives in Fort Lauderdale. Why are you telling me this now? Why didn't you tell me before? Over the next few days, she and I talked several times. She gave me Jody's address and told me that she had spoken to Jody and informed her that the divorce papers were ready. I gave the address to my attorney, who almost immediately sent Jody the divorce papers. Judy and I decided that Friday night we would go out to dinner and then come back to my house and watch the video. She didn't fail to point out that Revenge Entertainment was was off the table, and if that was my plan, I should forget about it. She wasn't going to sleep with her brother-in-law. Period. Thursday morning I was at work and received another call from Michael Hamilton. Hello, Mr. Taylor. Thought I'd bring you up to speed on current events. Stan Morrison just quit his job. He didn't give any notice. He just walked in, cleared his desk, told his boss, and left. He told one of the office staff that he was moving to Florida. Well, well, well. That's interesting. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. I appreciate what you told me. By the way, how are you doing? Very well, thank you for asking. My wife confessed to the theft and pleaded guilty. She'll get a light sentence, but her boyfriend is facing quite a long stay in jail. Hopefully he'll do his time every day as some big guy's girlfriend. I laughed. We chatted for a couple more minutes and ended the conversation. Then I called Judy. Hi. I was just thinking about you, she said when she answered. How long have you known that Stan Morrison was moving to Fort Lauderdale? To this day, I don't think she knew I knew his name. There was a long silence. Judy, how long have you known? Trey, I... How long? A few days. How many times have they seen each other since she moved in? Trey, listen. How many damn times have they seen each other since she moved in there? A short pause. Four. She's been here twice and he's traveled there twice. They've seen each other four times that you know of? And you were okay with knowing she was still having fun with that asshole? And you were okay with her coming back to me after all that? Trey, I, she's my sister and... I ended the conversation. My phone immediately rang. It was Judy. I ignored that call in the next three. I sat in my cubicle for a couple minutes and then went out to the repair shop. I enjoyed talking to the mechanics and watching them work on the vans. One of the mechanics was a good friend of mine. He was retired last year by the army because of an injury he received in Iraq. His left leg was torn off below the knee and two fingers on his left hand. He and my boss were the only two people at the dealership who knew about my situation. We went outside, sat down at the employee picnic table, and I brought him up to speed. 
I can arrange for it not to make it to Florida if you'd like. No. Neither one is worth going to jail over. I just want to get rid of her. I can arrange that too. I laughed. Nah. Living with myself is punishment enough. We talked some more until we heard over the loudspeaker. Trey, call line four. Trey, line four. I went back to my cubicle. Trey Taylor. Trey, please don't hang up. I hung up and walked over to the receptionist. I'm not getting any more calls today. I'm going home. I turned onto my street and saw Judy's car parked in front of my house. I pulled into my driveway and pulled into the garage. The garage door closed before she got to it, so she went to the front door and knocked. Apparently, she still remembered my threat about what I would do if she rang the bell. I entered the house through the garage and made my way into the kitchen. She was still knocking. I decided to open the door. You're not welcome here. Trey, listen. I closed the door in her face. I didn't slam it shut this time. I love Italian food, so I heated up a frozen dinner of spaghetti and meatballs and headed to my bedroom. By 10 p.m., I was asleep. The next morning, I showered, shaved, got dressed, and headed to work. Judy was waiting for me. She probably thought I wouldn't make a scene at work. She was wrong. I tried to walk past her. She grabbed my arm. Damn it, Trey, listen to me. You don't have anything to say that I want to hear. But I do have something to say to you. You let her come back to me knowing she was having fun with that low-down son of a bitch over and over again, and you weren't going to tell me about it. All three of you can rot in hell. It was a long time before I saw her again, but she occasionally talked to my mother. So now the entire dealership was aware of my situation. It was going to be a long day. I hung around the dealership for a couple of hours trying to figure out what I should do next. I managed to get through the day and headed home. My mom called and invited me over for dinner. I went and she made Italian food, of course. She, my stepdad, and I enjoyed the food and most of the evening. The enjoyment ended when she said, I was talking to Judy today. Mom, one more word about this family and I'll leave. Trey, listen to me. There's something you don't know. I know everything I need to know, Mom. Jody cheated and I'm divorcing her. Good. That's a good thing. She cheated and you're divorcing her. But what are you going to do about the baby? Oh shit, Mom. You're not going to fall for that, are you? There's nothing to fall for, Trey. She's pregnant. I talked to her myself when she was here. You what? I literally jumped up. I saw her and she told me. She was here and you didn't tell me? Trey, she asked us not to. So you listened to a certified cheating whore and disregarded your own son's feelings? We thought you needed a little more time to forgive her. Forgive her? Have you lost your mind? Have you forgotten what it's like to live with a cheater? Honey, things are different now. It's a different world. People are freer to try new things and... I jumped out of the house. Was I really living in some universe where everything was upside down? My mother had been through hell with my father cheating time after time, and now she was telling me that cheating might be okay for my wife. I loved my mother, but her naivete was astounding. And her gullibility? God help her. But in the age of smartphones and the internet, she would still buy an encyclopedia from a traveling salesman. But telling me I had to forgive Jody was overkill, even for her. I headed home, but I drove past my house and didn't stop. I ended up at a car dealership. I had my keys and went inside. There was a couch in the employee lounge and I laid down on it and tried to slow my thoughts down. It didn't work. I tossed and turned until almost 5 o'clock before I fell asleep. I woke up at half past 10. At this point, my boss came in and saw me sleeping, so he put a sign on the door and asked everyone not to disturb me. When I did start moving around, one of the salesmen told me that the boss wanted to see me in his office. I felt like crap. My back hurt from sleeping on the couch, I needed to shower and shave, and my mouth tasted like shit. But I went to see the boss. Trey, you need time off and I have a way to get it. You remember the Jacobsons, that older couple you sold the beautiful blue Prevost to a few months ago? Yes. Anyway, last week they were in Vancouver, Canada, and he had a heart attack. He'll be okay, but the carriage needs to go home. They want someone to bring him back and they asked for you. Sounds right up my alley. When can I fly out? 
You can fly out tomorrow. Janie will find you a flight. Use the company credit card for expenses. Sounds good. Now get your ass home, get cleaned up and packed. The return trip will take about four days. I'd take ten if I were you. The Jacobsons aren't in any hurry to get anywhere, and I don't need you back here too soon. Just give Ben all the deals you have pending and he can sort them out for you. Upon arrival in Vancouver, I went straight to the hospital. Mr. Jacobson had a lot of tubes and machines hooked up to him and sticking out of him, and Mrs. Jacobson was fiddling with him, trying to make him comfortable, while he grumbled that she was bothering him and keeping him awake. They both had smiles on their faces. It was obvious that they just wanted to be near each other and seemed grateful for it. I stood like that for a few minutes, watching them contentedly. I realized I was smiling for the first time in a long time. Mrs. Jacobson looked up and saw me. Trey, it's good to see you. She gave me a hug. Hi, Trey. How was the flight? Picked up Mr. Jacobson. Now be quiet, Robert. You know what the doctor said, said Mrs. Jacobson. She patted my arm. I can tell him to be quiet and he can't argue with me because it's doctor's orders. She winked at me. We sat and talked and watched as Robert drifted in and out of sleep. Every time we thought he had passed out, a nurse would come in and check his vitals, adjust his medications, or do some other medical-related job. Mrs. Jacobson told me where the motor bus was located. She also told me that their two grandchildren were with them, but the grandson had flown home. Their granddaughter was packing to take them home when Robert was discharged, but she, the granddaughter, would be traveling back with me. We had finished talking when the granddaughter walked in, carrying two small suitcases she had packed for the grandparents. She was about my age and as attractive as the girl next door. We were introduced to each other. She ignored the introductions and me and even snorted before she spoke to her grandmother. They chatted for a while, then turned to me. Darla, she pointed to her granddaughter, has been driving our car for the last week or so. We towed her behind the carriage. She'll take you to the bus and you can do whatever you need to do to get it ready to go. Darla started to protest but was interrupted. Stop it, Darla. I told you we'll be fine, so don't worry about us. She looked at me. No offense, Trey, but Darla doesn't want to go back with you. She thinks she needs to stay with us. By the way, Trey, your boss told us that you might need a few extra days to come back because you took some time off. You might want to consider traveling through Yellowstone. We promised Darla we'd drive through it on the way home. I'll see what I can do, Mrs. Jacobson. And we started to leave. Oh, Trey. Here's the letter authorizing you to get the bus across the border. Your boss said it was a good idea. She pulled the letter out of her purse. She held it out to me and kissed my cheek. Thanks for doing this and be careful. Darla and I headed to the car and then to the RV park. She drove but kept grunting and moaning but never said a word to me directly. I tried several times to strike up a conversation, but she made it clear she wasn't interested, so I stared out the side window. When we pulled up to the bus, she immediately went inside. I wanted to strap the car onto the bus and be ready for an early morning departure, but she took the car keys with her. I went inside and asked her for them. She literally threw them at me and I had to dodge to avoid getting hit in the eye. What the hell is wrong with you? I asked, reaching down to pick them up. I'd been dealing with asshole women for the past few weeks and I was damn sick of it. I walked over to the car, put it behind the carriage and hitched it up. I looked around the carriage and sat down in one of the lawn chairs. After a short break, I thought it would be nice to have a cold beer, so I put the chairs and small table in one of the lower compartments of the trunk and then went inside to see if the Jacobsons had any beer. Darla looked in the refrigerator. Is there any beer in there? Or anything tasty? I'm not your damn maid. She slammed the refrigerator door shut, walked to the bedroom, and closed the door. That was it. To hell with these women. They'd already shit on me enough. Jody, Judy, my mother, and now this bitch I didn't even know. I've had enough of them. All of them. Mrs. Jacobson was the only one who was even remotely civil. Ten days. I hadn't heard one polite word from that person all day, and I wasn't going to put up with her pathetic behavior any longer than necessary. I'd get that coach home in no time. The less time I spent with her, the better. I went outside, disconnected the outside power and water lines, went back inside, got in the driver's seat, started the engine, entered Houston, Texas into the GPS, pulled up the controls,
put it in gear, and drove south. It was already 6 p.m., and I didn't want to start the car until the next morning, but little Miss Godding in the bedroom made me change my mind. By 8 o'clock, I had crossed the United States border and gone through customs. She had to step outside to do so, after which she returned to the bedroom. The fuel tanks were full, so I had 200 gallons of no. One diesel and the big Cummins engine wanted to pump and pump, which we did. At 7 the next morning, we were in Burley, Idaho. I had stopped twice during the night to make coffee and sandwiches and was more than a little tired. I felt rather than saw the attitude of the little miss. She sat in the passenger seat and stared out the windshield. After a few minutes, she spoke. I'm hungry. Is there anything to eat? At her one word, my fatigue evaporated and my desire to get this trip over with as soon as possible increased. Remembering what she'd said to me the night before when I'd asked if she had anything good to eat, I replied, I'm not your damn maid, I said, pressing down on the gas pedal. She gave me a glare and then stormed back into the bedroom. A little before nine, I really needed to piss, so I stopped by the rest area. I went into the restroom on the bus and peed. When I got off, she had already opened the front door and was getting off the bus. If you get off the bus, you can't get back on because I'm leaving. I sat back down and pressed the button to release the parking brake. I put it in gear just in time for her to storm back into the bedroom. By noon, my ass was aching. Driving 18 hours wasn't the best idea, but I was driving and my ass was sore, so I pulled into another parking lot, parked between two 18-wheel trucks, and lay down on the couch. I passed out almost immediately. I woke up to the hum of a Cummins diesel and the sensation of motion. I sat up and looked at the clock. I had been asleep for five hours. Miss? Attitude was in the driver's seat and we were driving. Fast. I got up and walked over to where I could look over her shoulder. After watching for a couple minutes, I decided she knew what she was doing. Apparently, her grandfather had taught her well. I made a cup of coffee, sat in the passenger seat and sipped. Two hours and not a word. Good. However, I was starting to get concerned about the fuel situation. We had been driving for about 25 hours or so. At an average speed of 60, we had traveled about 1,500 miles. At 8 miles per hour, we had burned almost all of our fuel. I decided to bring up the subject. We should probably stop at the next parking lot to get gas. No response. I'm sorry, but we may need fuel. I took care of that while your sorry ass was snoring. She was full of surprises, this girl. I went back to the couch and soon fell asleep again. I didn't see her go to the bathroom, eat or drink. She must have had time to do everything while I slept. For another three hours I slept while she drove. I was impressed with her ability to drive and control her bladder. Finally, she pulled into a truck stop in Dumas, Texas and parked. It was a little after 10 in the evening. She got up and I watched as she made a sandwich, grabbed a soda from the fridge, and disappeared into the bedroom. That was my cue to drive. So I did. After making two chicken salad sandwiches and brewing a thermos of coffee, I got in the driver's seat and headed for Houston. I stopped once during the night to take a leak and buy some Cheetos and coffee. At 8 in the morning, I pulled into the parking lot of the Houston dealership. I needed to sleep, but I also wanted to use the restroom, so I opened the door and went downstairs. It was the first time I had gotten off the bus since we went through U.S. Customs. When was that? A week ago? Of course not, but it felt like it. It had actually been less than 40 hours. My butt was dragging, but at least I was done with Little Miss Attitude. I used the restroom normally reserved for our customers because I really needed to go. I got out just in time to see Jacobson's car pulling out of the gate. The driver's window was open and a middle finger hanging up in the air. I returned the greeting. It was almost time for the staff to arrive, so I decided to make coffee in the employee break room. As I walked in there, I felt the couch calling my name and I answered. I didn't move until three in the afternoon. I got up, yawned, scratched my butt, and walked out the door. There was a note written on it in large letters that said, if I woke up, I would see my boss. I walked down the hall and knocked. Come in. I entered. You know, the other employees are getting tired of you monopolizing the break room. I yawned. I got a call this morning. From Mrs. Jacobson. I scratched my ass again and sat up. It was a very interesting conversation. A pause. She wanted to know how you did it. 
I was in a hurry to get back, so I made myself drive too long and too hard. Oh, we know how you got home. She was curious to know how you did it without killing her granddaughter. What? Apparently the granddaughter is a real pain in the ass and doesn't seem to care at all about other people's feelings. The Jacobsons didn't want to send her home with you, but they didn't want her with them either. She caused them nothing but inconvenience the entire time she was with them on the trip. The grandson left because he couldn't stand having her sitting in the railroad car with him any longer. I know how he feels. The only reason I spent so much time driving was because every time I took the wheel, I imagined my hands on her throat, and it felt so good I didn't want to stop. He laughed. Anyway, they're glad you made it home okay. Mr. Jacobson will be discharged in another week or so. All indications are that after a little recovery period, he'll be as good as new. They want us to service the bus. We'll do that and have one of the guys drive it to them. That's good news, both about him and keeping the coach. I thought they were going to want to sell him. Oh, hell no. They like him, and they've even talked about becoming full owners of the RV. Okay, now I want you to go home for a couple days and get some rest. But... No buts, damn it. Just do what I tell you to do. It might give the other employees a chance to get their break room back. I'd only been gone three days, but it felt like much longer. I came home, took a much-needed shower, shaved, and went to bed. Of the next two days, I slept for probably 30 hours, but at some point I had to get back into the real world. The first step in that direction was, I assumed, to check my phone and see what I had missed. I hadn't thought about it at all over the past few days. I started looking for it. I looked in the pockets of the clothes I wore on the trip to Vancouver, but it wasn't there. I called my boss and asked him to check the break room and coach's room to make sure it was there. But it wasn't there. Damn! How many customer calls had I missed? I headed over to the dealership. There were a few messages from customers there, and I started answering them. By noon, I was up to speed. I went into the employee break room, made myself a cup of coffee, and was just starting to head back to my cubicle when I saw her walk in. Little Miss Godding. I turned and headed for the staff area. I stayed there, hiding, for about ten minutes when the loudspeaker came on. Trey, come to my office, please. Trey, to my office. I took my time and sipped my coffee. Trey, into my office, please. I knocked. Come in. Oh, good, there you are. I believe you know Darla Jacobson. She was telling me about the trip from Canada. She just sat there. I looked at him in bewilderment. I had, of course, told him all about the trip. A glint appeared in his eyes that I'd only seen a couple times before. Once when the dealership had an exceptional sales month and he saw nothing but dollar signs. Another time when his twin sons got scholarships to attend the University of Texas. The bastard was enjoying it. He grinned. Miss. Jacobson is here to return your cell phone. Apparently you left it in her grandparents' car. At that moment, his phone rang. If you two will excuse me, I have to take this call. She stood up and I indicated for her to leave the office. She walked into the showroom and I followed her at what I thought was a safe distance. She stopped and I did the same. She turned to face me and held out her hand. In it was my cell phone. I was too far away from her to take it, so she took a couple steps toward me. I backed up the same number of steps. She almost smiled. Am I really that bad? She took a few steps to the nearest table and placed the phone on it. Yes. She stepped away from the table and I picked up the phone and headed back to the service area. The thought of saying thank you didn't cross my mind. Trey. I stopped and cautiously turned around to her. I heard some of your messages. I couldn't help it. I heard them when they were left. You did a huge favor for my grandparents and you're dealing with your own problems. Trey, I'm really sorry for the way I acted. She turned and walked out of the salon. Well, isn't that bullshit? She had a soft side. And it even seemed genuine. I went to my stall and sat down. It had only been a couple minutes when there was a heavy rumble from outside. I looked toward the street and saw that at least two cars had been hit. Normally, I don't get involved in these things and let the professionals handle it. But one of the salesmen who was outside came in and said, Trey, I think that silver car is the lady who came to see you. Oh, shit. I ran to the scene of the accident. It was her. The medics weren't there yet, but one person was trying to stop the bleeding on Darla's scalp. 
Someone else was dealing with what appeared to be a broken arm. Darla looked up and saw me, and this time she actually smiled. You always catch me at my best. Then she passed out. The EMTs arrived shortly after and stabilized Darla and the passenger in the other car and took them to the hospital. I heard them tell the police investigator which hospital they were going to. I went back to work. I had been sitting at my desk for about 15 minutes when I remembered the Jacobsons. I thought I should call them and let them know about Darla. I did so and assured them that she didn't seem to be in any danger. Cuts, bruises, and maybe a broken arm. But I thought she would be okay. I heard Mrs. Jacobson say this to her husband. Then I heard his reply. A broken arm? Too bad it wasn't her neck. That might have knocked some humanity into her. After the husband had been sufficiently punished, Mrs. Jacobson asked me if I would call Darla's parents and let them know. She gave me their number and I called. Then I remembered my cell phone. There were 54 messages, half from my mother, the rest from Judy, potential clients, and one from Michael Hamilton. I called the potential clients and set up four appointments for the next couple days. The others I ignored. I left work at five and headed home. The hospital the ER doctor said they were headed to was very close to my house, but I ended up there anyway. At the information desk, I learned that her room was room 646. I went there. When I walked in, she already had visitors. Her parents. Trey, I'd like you to meet my parents. Mom, Dad, this is Trey Taylor. Trey, my parents are Ralph and Joanna Jacobson. Nice to meet you, Trey. Darla won't stop talking about your trip, her mother said. I bet she didn't, I thought. How could you stand two days with her on that little bus? She would have driven me crazy, said her father. It's not a bus, Dad. It's an intercity bus. It is a bus. A rather fancy one, but a bus nonetheless. Don't mind him, Trey. How are you? Fine, except for a broken arm and a few stitches. Well, uh, I'd better get going. Just thought I should check on you. Take care of yourself. Thanks for stopping by. Oh, Trey, said her father. Thanks for calling my parents and us. You're welcome. Goodbye. I went home and started debating with myself about whether or not I should call my mother. The debate was short-lived. The negative side won because I couldn't see the positive side. And so it went on for about three weeks. My mother and Judy repeatedly tried to call, but I ignored them. Even my stepfather called. I talked to him, but cut the conversation short when he tried to connect me to my mother. My attorney mailed the divorce papers to the address Judy had given me. Apparently, she liked living with Morrison and having fun with him because her signature was big, bold, and written in bright red magic marker. There was no mention of her pregnancy if indeed it existed. In about two months, I would be a free man. I was beginning to think about staying single. The thought of it brought other thoughts to mind. Like the celibacy I was going through. Celibacy, damn it, I had been dry for so long. I only sat for a minute before heading to the bathroom to shower and get ready for dinner. I had just finished getting dressed when the phone rang. Trey Taylor. Hi, Trey, this is Dottie Jacobson. Well, hello, Mrs. Jacobson. How are you doing? And how's the patient? Call me Dottie, please, Trey. He's fine. In fact, even better than fine. We're planning our next trip and he wants to go to Colorado, but I'm a little apprehensive about how he'll drive in these mountains. What do you think? Dottie, this trainer is not going to let him get in trouble. All he has to do is turn on the Jake brake and leave it on, and as long as he doesn't try to break the speed limit, he'll be all right. That's what he says. He's been reading articles about driving in the mountains and really wants to try it. I think I need to take some Valium before we go. She laughed when she said that. I was sure from experience with them that she would go with him anywhere he wanted to go, when he wanted to go there, and vice versa. I like this couple. Anyway, I called to invite you to a little barbecue we're having in honor of Robert's recovery. It's going to be at our house this Friday at 6 o'clock. Bring your wife. We'd love to meet her. It dawned on me that I had never discussed my personal life with them, and apparently Darla, having heard some of my messages, hadn't either, so they had no idea I was almost divorced. Thank you, Dottie. I'd love to come over. I'll see you around. It was a good week. I'm usually happy if I sell one van a week. This week there were three. 
One was a used high-end bus owned by a country music star that had been upgraded to a newer, more expensive model. My commission for the week was very good. Really, really, really good. I pulled up to Jacobson's estate at 6 sharp. Off to the side of the main house was a large garage where I realized they kept their boat. After I had driven it over from Vancouver, it had been serviced and cleaned and the service department had returned it to them. I knew they had money because they wrote a very substantial check for the carriage house, but their estate was impressive. I pulled up to the house and the valet parked my car. I've been to six county fairs and goat races, but I've never asked the valet to park my car at a private home. I was led through the house to the backyard. There were already about 50 people there. Dottie, seeing me, gave me a hug and asked where my wife was. I explained that I was in the process of getting a divorce. She held me at arm's length and told me that my wife was an idiot. She then put her arm around my waist and led me to the rest of the guests. Listen to me, Trey. When you're ready, I know some nice young ladies who would love to meet someone like you. She then introduced me to the rest of the guests as a friend, not the guy who sold them the carriage. I knew that I was going with some pretty big dogs in this crowd and that all the nice young ladies she would introduce me to would be beyond me. I decided to hang around for a very short time and leave. I was just finishing my brisket sandwich and beer and looking for Dottie and Robert to say goodbye when I saw Darla running away from some guy. I didn't realize she was here, but I probably should have assumed she would be. I'd seen that look before and didn't want any part of it, so I turned around so she wouldn't see me. It was too late. Come on, Trey, she said, grabbing my hand. First Dottie and now Darla. It was a family of hand grabbers. She led me inside to the library. There was a freaking library in this house. This guy is a goddamn asshole. He said I have a behavior problem and I need help. I started to walk away. Where are you going? Leaving before you kick me out because I agree with him. He shouldn't have said that out loud and in front of people. Someone should. Damn it, Trey. You're supposed to be on my side. Why? The only polite words you ever said to me were said while you were lying in the street, bleeding and probably delirious. She flopped down rather than sat up. I remained standing. We never looked at each other. How's the arm? I asked. It itches like hell under the cast. I have to carry this so I can scratch it. She pulled something that looked like a back scratcher out of the cast. It had tiny fingers, so it fit between the cast and her hand so she could reach the itchy spot. I'll be glad when this thing comes off. She pointed to the cast. I've got to go. Trey? Yeah? If I promise to behave, will you have dinner with me? After a brief pause, I said, Darla, I'm going through a divorce, so I don't need the added stress, and I'm likely to do something that will make you angry and make things worse. So I don't think dinner is a good idea. I left. Saturday morning, my mom rang my doorbell. I let her in. Here's the deal. I've thought it over carefully, and I agree with you. There are things we have to compromise on, and there are things we don't have to compromise on. Faithfulness in marriage is on the no-compromise list. You reminded me of the hell I went through with your father, and no one should have to go through that. I apologize for even thinking about you getting Jody back. I was selfish, only thinking about the baby and the possibility of having a grandchild. Please forgive me. I forgave and we hugged. We chatted for another hour or so, hugged again, and she left. Mid-morning Monday, my phone rang. Trey Taylor. Good morning, Trey. It's Michael Hamilton. I have some news. I don't know since when he started calling me by my first name, but what the hell? What's the news? Stan Morrison called and asked for his job back. They said no. I laughed. Just thought you might be interested. Thanks, Michael. I'm on a first-name basis with him now. Shortly before noon, Jacobson's carriage pulled into the yard and parked right in front of the building. I was with customers so I couldn't get out and greet them, but I was able to see him. I sat and talked to my potential clients for at least 30 minutes, but no one got off the bus. I walked them to their car and then walked to the bus and rang the doorbell. Darla answered it. Hi. Come on in. I stepped into the coach. When you enter a bus like this, the door is right next to the passenger seat. There are usually three or four steps leading up to the bus. 
When you go up the steps, you must immediately turn left or you will run into the driver's seat. When the bus is moving and the passenger is in their seat, the floor is pushed back to cover the steps so your feet don't dangle on the stairwell. Anyway, I entered the coach and followed her into the living room. Have a seat. I sat down. The wonderful smell of lasagna wafted from the oven. There were two wine glasses on the kitchen counter. She handed me one of them and took the other for herself. She held out hers to me, indicating that we should clink. We did and both took a sip each. It was a very good Chianti. I hadn't said anything until then. She leaned her back against the stove and recoiled from the heat. Then she moved back a little and leaned her back against the counter. She took a rather large sip. You said you couldn't have dinner, but I thought I could have lunch. I also thought I might embarrass or piss you off in public, so I thought it would be more private. I asked my grandparents if I could use a coach, and when I explained the reason to them, they thought it was a good idea. He just made me promise not to drive back when I got mad. Notice I said when, not if. He knows you well, doesn't he? Instead of the expected explosion in her red face, she took a rather large sip of her Chianti. Her face reddened, but she didn't explode. I took a sip of mine. She turned her back to me and stayed like that even after she filled her glass. I saw her take a deep breath and turn to me again. I hope you're hungry. I made it this morning. My lasagna is delicious even if I do say so myself. She busied herself with the salad and garlic bread. I thought to myself that she was doing pretty well with a cast on one arm. The doorbell rang. Bring it in, please. I got up, walked over to the dashboard, and pressed the button. The door opened. My boss stood there. He looked at me. It's okay. I looked down at him. For now. I closed the door and went back to my chair and wine. I watched her and she seemed to be enjoying it. Her movements were natural, and it was obvious she knew her way around a kitchen, even one as small as this one. I smiled, but only for a moment. I knew one of us was bound to do something to piss the other off. It was only a matter of time. She told me to sit down at the dining room table. So I did. Generally speaking, a bus 45 feet long and 8.5 feet wide didn't have much room inside. The sliding drawers increased the width of the living room and bedroom to about 11 feet. The living room begins just behind the driver and passenger seats. Then the dining room and kitchen, located across from each other. Then the bathroom and shower and the bedroom at the back of the bus. We ate and chatted and realized we had finished a bottle of Chianti. I also realized that neither of us had pissed the other off. After a couple hours, I decided it was time for me to go back to work. Darla, thank you. It was a nice surprise, and the food was delicious. My pleasure. I headed for the door, and she followed me. I took a step down to leave. Trey? I turned my head to look at her. She leaned over and kissed me, softly and gently. Neither of us knew who was more shocked. There was a long pause while we just looked at each other. Is dinner still off the table? She asked with a twinkle in her eyes. How about tonight? I'd love to. Say, seven o'clock? It was only a few hours away. She gave me her address and I started to leave. Again. But we kissed. Again. And again. It took me another ten minutes to leave. When I finally got off the bus, I saw six faces looking at me through the window of the exhibit hall. Among them was my boss. When they saw that I had spotted them, they all scattered, except for my boss. He opened the door in front of me as I walked in. Well? I'm going home to get ready for my date tonight. We laughed. Ten minutes later, Darla pulled the bus out of the parking lot. I was on my way to her house when my phone rang. Trey Taylor. So you managed not to kill each other, huh? Hey, Dottie. I believe Robert's listening. You bet he is I'm listening? We've already heard her story. Now we want to hear yours. I laughed. You know a gentleman never tells. Horse hockey. Hush, Robert. Trey, it was funny when she asked us to borrow the coach. She was nervous and didn't want to tell us why she needed it, but Robert wouldn't let her borrow it unless she did. So she did. As she was telling us, she got excited and told us about the lasagna she had made. I asked her how she knew you liked lasagna. I just know, Grandma. And she blushed, Trey. 
I've known this girl all my life and I didn't realize she knew how... But she did blush. Trey, Robert picked up on that. I can't believe I'm saying this, especially considering that girl's shitty attitude. Robert, watch your language. Yeah, honey. Anyway, Trey, as far as I know, that girl has never done anything like that. She might piss me off. Robert? I'm sorry. She might piss me off, but she's still my granddaughter, so you better treat her right. Do you understand? Yes, sir, but I think you're overreacting a bit. Bull! Sorry, Dottie. Trey, just don't touch her. Okay? She's had some pretty rough experiences in relationships. She is, as you know, very attractive, and it seems like her whole life men have been trying to take advantage of her. It started back in high school, and she's had a hard time dealing with it. Unfortunately, her attitude is her defense mechanism, and she uses it to avoid getting close to someone and then being disappointed in them. The problem is that she has a hard time distinguishing friends from enemies, but that's just a facade. There's a good girl out there somewhere. It's just that sometimes we have a hard time finding her, Dottie says. I'm not going to hurt her, Dottie, and Robert. Good, they said together. But you asked her not to hurt me? And we all laughed. Before I could finish talking, my phone rang again. Trey Taylor. Trey, it's Judy. Silence. I went from happy to furious in an instant, but I decided to hear her out. Are you still there? What do you want, Judy? I thought you should know that Jody. Stop it. I don't want to hear anything about her. Trey, please. Just listen for a minute. Yesterday, she kicked Stan out for having an affair. Today, he came back to the house and beat her up. She's in the hospital, Trey. Her nose is broken. He knocked her down and kicked her. She's in intensive care. And Stan is in jail. What about her baby? It's gone. She lied about it to get you to take her back. Well, she sure fooled my mom. She fooled us all, Trey. I'm sorry she got hurt, but it's none of my business anymore. And Morrison, as far as I'm concerned, can rot in jail. She's still your wife until the divorce is final. She stopped being my wife when she got in his car and made the divorce official when she signed the papers. Whatever is going on in her life now has nothing to do with me. Goodbye. Darla lived in a gated community. After seeing her grandparents' estate, it wasn't surprising, but the reaction of the guard at the gate was surprising. He asked who I was visiting, and I told him. Really? And he started laughing. He laughed when he called her to see if she was expecting me, and he was still laughing when he opened the gate. I heard him say good luck as I drove through the gate. Fifteen minutes later, as we drove through the gate heading for the exit, he was on the phone and still laughing. I got the impression that she was not the nicest person in this congregation. I discovered that she liked meat and potatoes. She ordered a medium, rare ribeye steak with blue cheese butter and baked potatoes. That's my kind of food. I fleetingly wondered how she was going to cut the steak with her arm in a cast, but she managed. We both laughed about how awkward it was, and I even offered to cut it for her, but she managed. She managed to eat about half of the steak, after which she ignored it and focused on her drink. Our waiter suggested putting the leftovers in a doggy bag. I didn't realize you had doggy bags here. There's a first time for everything, he said. We stopped at the security gate to enter the password, and the same security guard was there. Instead of laughing, he made a surprised look on his face. I commented to Darla. I don't have many dates, and he's not used to me coming home after them in the same car I leave in. I usually come home in a cab. That seemed logical to me. When we pulled up to her house, she invited me in. What would you like to drink? A gin and tonic. We sat and sipped, barely speaking. Finally, she stood up and walked over to me. She gave me a hint, I got her point, and we got down to it. I think we should spend more time getting to like each other. Don't we? And so we did. At nine in the morning, I called my boss and told him I wouldn't be in. Why? I'm still on my date from last night. He laughed. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.